Okay. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, welcome to the July meeting of the Space Association of Australia. My name is Michael Abdilla, for those that don't know me. Welcome to uh, any new people tonight. Um, thanks for coming out on this cold July evening. Um, All right. Um, <coughs> sorry about that. So uh, tonight we are having a little bit of the, our feature presentation is uh, on women in space. So we're going to be uh, looking at a, a new documentary on the history of women in the US space program. It's quite a fascinating uh, program. I'll get to that explanation in a while. But in the meantime, I was just wondering if um, anyone can name the female astronauts on this, on this page. Do we know who this is? Sally Ride, yep. Um, any others that you recognise? Yep. Oh. Space industry capability that was announced just a couple of weeks back. The feature, as I said, women in space. Have a break. And then um, uh, Andrew Rennie will talk about uh, planetary and space science update. And I'm hoping he's going to be talking about Cassini and Juno, amongst many other things, I'm sure. <laughs> and uh, after that, we'll have uh, a new space update with, with Angelo and, um, and myself. So that's the meeting for tonight. So um, this was the reference to the review of the Australian um, space industry. It was announced by the Minister uh, for Industry, Science and Innovation, Arthur Sinodinus, on the 13th of July. And basically, he's announced, you might say, yet another review of Australia's space capability. but. It seems uh, that this time uh, he does seem to be quite uh, optimistic that this will result in the creation of an Australian Space Agency and that will sort of kick, kick start and really develop the Australian space uh, industry in this country. So this is a report that appeared on the, on the uh, ABC news site. And so the, the ABC and a number of other sort of uh, media outlets covered this, including uh, Sky News. Um, there was an interview on the project the other night on Channel 10. Uh, a number of other outlets took the story. And all of them seem to paint a very optimistic picture uh, of what might come out of the uh, out of the review. So basically, the key points that were uh, in the media release from the from the minister uh, was talk about the global space industry revenue being more than four hundred million dollars annually, and the idea is, of course, that the um, the, the local industry and also the government is keen to, to get their hands on at least some of that. They are, the review is to set the scene for developing a space industry in Australia. And there will be an expert panel that will report by the end of March next year. So I think that begins, the expert panel uh, starts in, I think it's August, so I think it's next month that the expert panel begins. And um, they report back in March of next year. So we were hoping that there was that there was going to be an announcement at the uh, International Astronautical Congress in Adelaide in September. So obviously we don't think that's going to happen now that this review has been put in place. But what's uh, quite exciting, I suppose, is that. Um, 
the media release, <coughs> the language of the media release was all about, uh, you know, how do we set the scene for developing a space industry in Australia? I'm sorry. <laughs> and what, um, what role changed governance arrangements could play, including possibly the role of a space agency. So uh, it was explicit in the words of the minister during the, the interview. So, um, and this is the expert reference group. Uh, you'll probably recognise some of the names there. Uh, Michael Davis is the chair of the uh, Space Industry Association of Australia who released that uh, white paper uh, a few months back now. Um, Dr. Jason Held from Sydney, who presented at one of our meetings uh, a few months back. And uh, I don't know, I know, I happen to know uh, Flavia Tata Nardini from Adelaide, and she is one of the founders of that fleet um, uh, aerospace startup in Adelaide. <coughs> What's interesting is who's not on that list. Sorry, what was that? What's interesting who's not on that list. Yes. You know, like Brett Biddington, who's been actively against a space agency forever. Yeah. As he talks about, he talks about the legal factor. Yes. As soon as you mention space agency, nobody takes it seriously. Right. So it's interesting that Brett has always had his finger in everything is not in that list of people. And it was rather unfortunate uh, I saw two, or listened to two uh, of those media reports and everything was going swimmingly until the interviewer said, so why do you think Australia needs a new space station? Is this on the project? The project, but also on uh, Triple J and some, somewhere else. So they, um, for some reason people, uh, journalists, uh, somehow confuse space agencies with space stations. So what do you think they're Triple J so they can remember their call sign? <laughs> so, anyway. So, uh, watch this space. Okay. Excuse the pun. Okay. Just a reminder that the formula for our meetings are the fourth Monday of each month and then the, these are the dates of our meetings uh, that are forthcoming this year. And just a reminder that um, some of you, not all, but some would have received a, a membership rene renewal reminder and uh, in recent times, and we would be grateful for you to renew your membership if... Yeah, but where's my little red book? The little red book. Yeah. Okay, so what I want to do is uh, go into the uh, main presentation for, t for tonight, which is this, this documentary. Uh, this documentary um, is a PBS documentary, and it's, it's called Makers, and there's a series of films about women who made America. So there's, uh, there's one on women in politics, there's one on women in sport, there's another on women in business, and there's this one, which is women in space. We could make one today called Men Who Broke America. We could. Men or man? Man, yeah, that, man. That, yeah. Indeed, that would trump the women in space. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Countdown starts. Well, good evening, everyone. 
Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm, my name's Andrew Rennie, uh, producer and presenter of the Space Show. And first of all, we have an announcement about a meeting. Uh, you've all, I hope, by now seen the globe of, guess what planet it is? Ah, it is a planet, a dwarf planet. Okay, a dwarf planet. And yes, okay, Pluto. So uh, do have a look at that if you can't. Now, the two of the people involved in the New Horizons mission to Pluto, um, which by the way is now two years since it flew by, are going to be here in Melbourne on Wednesday week. And they're going to be talking at RMIT from 6.30 to 8.30. One of them is Alan Stern, who is the project scientist. And the other one, whose name I can't remember, but he's, he's involved in the engineering side of the New Horizons mission. And they're both going to be talking at RMIT on Wednesday week. And I don't have a URL or anything like that to put up. So look out for that. Um, we may get a notice out. Uh, I only found out about this on Friday when the American, the AAAI, or whatever it is, um, the American Aeronautics and Astronautics Institute sent out an email about it. So uh, you may get it, a circulated email about it in the next few days, but you do need to register for it because accommodation is limited. It's free, but you need to register. And it's, registrations are done through an organisation called Eventbrite. Now, I'm going to try and rush through this month's thing, and then if there's any time when this thing gets to zero, before it gets to zero, I'll do last month's as well. We'll head into it. A few days ago, there was a briefing by the European Space Agency, which even made a, a clip on SBS News and possibly other channels here in Australia. Okay. <laughs> I'm off camera, apparently. Uh, and at that briefing, they were describing the Bepi Colombo mission. They have completed the spacecraft and have now got it ready for... Um, well, they're going to disassemble it again, actually, and then ship it off to uh, Kourou for launch. It's made of two main missions. One is the Mercury Planetary Orbiter, or MPO, which is the European Space Agency section. And the other one is the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter, or MMO. And that's from Japan. So as part of this two-hour briefing, which I'll spare you from having to watch, I have extracted a few screen grabs of the from the video of that presentation. So, and I'm going to concentrate on the Japanese one because they, very interestingly, they issued, uh, or rather they described some of their future plans in planetary exploration. So if we go to the next slide, uh, Bepi Colombo, for those who aren't familiar with it, has now finished its um, mechanical tests and those are the things they're going to do in the near future and they hope to launch it in October 2018. It was going to be launched earlier in 2018, but because of a few problems they had in developing the European side of it, they had to postpone the launch until the next opportunity for a launch to Mercury. So that will now be in October of next year. Okay, next slide. The MPO uh, is the European part, and it's going to concentrate mainly on the surface and interior science of the thing and of Mercury. And it'll be the one that orbits uh, closest to Mercury, uh, having a, uh, uh, a polar orbit going over the North and South Poles of 480 kilometres uh, periapse. I prefer to use perigee even though it's not a perigee, and a high point of 1,500 kilometres. And go around every 2.3 hours 
And note the data, for those who are into computers, you'll see the data bit uh, return right there. The Japanese one, the Mercury Magnetospheric Orbiter, studying the environment of the thing, and particularly the magnetosphere of the planet, has a higher orbit and goes around every 9.3 hours. But don't hold your breath for it being there in the very near future because it's going to take about seven or eight years to get there. Next uh, slide. The, magnetis the Japanese part is going to do all those things there. And I know you know, haven't read it all yet, but let's move on. JAXA had two representatives speaking at this event, and one was from ISAS, the Institute of Space and Astronautical Sciences, at, uh, it, it, which is part of JAXA now. And they, just, they described some of the JAXA missions, many of which you'll be familiar with. For example, Hayabusa, uh, which explored an asteroid, and Hinodi, which has been studying the sun, and, and ret has returned fantastic images of the sun. And then uh, Kaguya uh, is in orbit around the moon. And remember, it did that high def the first high-definition video in orbit around the moon. Uh, Akatsuki is now in orbit around Venus and has had some problems. First of all, when it arrived at Venus, it missed the orbit insertion and had to go around the sun again and come back several years later. And they finally got into orbit around um, Venus. It's been doing some fantastic science, but it's had its problems. And the last report I saw a few days ago, it, it shut down, uh, they hope, temporarily. On the same launch as that, was Acarus, the solar sail, which uh, they last had contact with uh, several years ago now, and but uh, it's still considered to be operational. Uh, moving down here, Hayabusa 2 is on its way towards an asteroid and will come back with a sample in uh, 2020, uh, hopefully landing in uh, Australia at Woomera. Uh, the Astro H or X ray astronomy mission uh, failed uh, soon after launch, and they're now doing a, a, a backup mission. And then there's the ERG, the, uh, which in Japanese is called a RAISE, and that was launched last year and is studying the Van Allen belt in the same way that the American Van Allen probes are doing so. Uh, well, complementary mission. Okay, next slide. slide. So at the moment, JAXA is working with the European Space Agency, with Hinodi and Bepi Colombo. And you can see the status there. Okay, next one. ISAS, the Institute of Space and Astronautical Sciences. That's what ASA stands for. Anyway, they're working with uh, Bepi Colombo uh, on the MMO and reading from the bottom, we've got SLIM, which is depended, uh, intended to land on the moon and that's led by JAXA. Hayabusa 2, again led by JAXA, that's the one that I mentioned is bringing back a sample of an asteroid. In the way that Hayabusa 1 did, and then the one I'm going to talk a bit about is the Martian Moons Explorer, which is quite an exciting mission. JUICE is led by the European Space Agency, and that's going to explore the um, Jupiter and its moons, icy moons. And they're also assessing whether or not to do a mission which is similar to the Lucy mission uh, which I described several months ago, which is going to the Trojan asteroids. So uh, they haven't decided yet whether to do that one. The Martian moons one is definitely underway, as are all these other missions. Right, next slide, please. Now, the Martian moons exploration mission is quite an interesting one. They're going to approach the moons Phobos and Deimos, land and collect samples and bring it back to Earth. And there's a particular reason why they're doing that. But before we get into that, 
Note the launch date is planned for 2024, arrival at Mars the following year. Three samples collected. Uh, the touchdown and, and, and surface reside time would be a couple of hours at the most. Uh, unlike the Hayabusa, which is a touch and go, and unlike the American mission underway at the moment, which is also a touch and go, this is actually will land and stay there for a little while before taking off again. It'll leave the orbit of Mars in 2028 and hopefully return in 2029 back to Earth with the samples. Now you can see there in the picture those white circle and those things pointing out, they're ion thrusters. You can also see uh, there the, uh, the return capture, but I'll show you that in, I think, it's the next picture. Thanks. Uh, but, oh, so it's not the next picture, but I'll get to it. In this description, they, uh, they are described some of what they call the L-class missions, which are launched on an H-2A rocket. And reading from the bottom, we've got the X-ray astronomy recovery mission, which is that one that failed uh, earlier, it earlier this year or late last year, I can't remember now. And they're going to refly that in 2020. And then the Martian Moons Explorer in uh, 2024. A solar sail experiment or something similar is considered for 2027. And then SPICA, S-B-I-C-A, um, is going to look for um, dust, look at fine dust in the, um, in the solar system. And that's still under consideration uh, for the late 2020s. Okay, next slide. M-class missions, competitively chosen in the same way that NASA does. Uh, we have Hisaki, which is uh, an ultraviolet mission in 2013. Uh, the ERG, which was launched last year in uh, 2016. Moving on to the SLIM, or the moon landing mission, which is planned for two years' time. And then they're under consideration a third mission, uh, sorry, a number four mission in, the, in this M-class series, uh, which, because it's competitive, I can't say what it is yet because we don't know. <laughs> uh, but these are missions of about $150 million or less in cost. Right, next picture. So there's their science roadmap for JAXA. And we've got... Um, from 2010, we've got the X-ray mission recovery in about 2020, MMX in 2024, uh, the light bird or solar sail still under consideration, which is why it's in grey, and speaker, which uh, looks like it's going to go ahead. The M-class missions further down here are Hisaki, ERG, and SLIM, and one they they've don't say much about yet is destiny, uh, but it's uh, it's under again under consideration. And now we have uh, Betty Baby Columbo, of course. It's already been built, ready for launch or getting ready for launch. Uh, Juice, the European mission to the um, to Jupiter. W first with NASA is not yet approved, but that would go in about 2025 on the uh, American W first mission. And we have Athena, which is a European mission in uh, 2028. Okay, next slide, quick. Uh, foreign agency-led mi missions, uh, you can read them there. I've pr pretty much covered the territory there already, so let's go to the next picture. And here's a, from the JAXA website a picture of the Japanese magnetospheric orbiter around Mercury. Next picture. Now, the strategy that JAXA and ISAS are using to study the, you know, deciding which missions to launch is when the solar system formed, pretty much everything out beyond Mars should have been pretty dry because it was too hot for water. And the water would have been further out, which is why we've got comets and stuff like that further out. The question is, well, then how did the Earth and Mars get the water? So 
the question is, you know, NASA, when they're looking at Mars, is saying, okay, if we're going to look for life, follow the water. Well, the Japanese are saying, uh, let's follow the water and see why is it that the water, how did the water come into the inner solar system? And that, a number of their missions then are going to be aimed at doing that, in particular, the, the Martian Moons mission. Okay, next slide. So here we go with the Martian Moons uh, mission. And uh, when it's launched, it'll be in that configuration there. And hopefully I can press the... All right, so there's your ion thrusters. And uh, you've got the... It's got on legs. That Those are the landing legs for when it lands on the moons. And we've got a return module uh, stuck in there somewhere. Okay, next slide. So once it's underway, uh, it has solar power. Okay, next slide. Now, one of the reasons for looking at Phobos and to some extent is sorry, I'm lost the sound there for a while. Is what is it? What is the surface like? We know it's grey, a uh, very dark material. It's not ice. It has many of the Phobos and Deimos have many of the characteristics of asteroids, and. The question is, are they captured asteroids or did they form in place at Mars? So th the Japanese are now doing some experiments to simulate the soil, the regolith of Phobos and uh, Deimos and to try and figure out, okay, how do we make a drill that can sample this material and recover it successfully when we don't know what it's like? So they're doing a lot of experiments so they can cope with all sorts of materials. So they've got a simulant there, which is, is it very fine grain material, like talcum powder? Or is it coarse grain material, small pebbles, sandy type, what we regard as sandy type material on a beach? What is it made of? How can we cope with both all these types? Okay, next one. Uh, so there's a picture of MMX in flight configuration. Next one. The return capsule. They're doing design studies at the moment of the return capsules. Remember, they do have experience with Hayabusa uh, in uh, getting samples back. So it's going to look very similar to the Hayabusa. Next slide. And some models. Right, next one. Now, that's the Japanese side of things. Now, on Mars, you will all be aware of the disaster, bad things, naughty things that are happening, where they're getting holes. See, look at this. Parts of these cleats are coming off, and there's holes and so on. Now, what they've been doing is running the rover. Now, imagine that this is a, a Martian wheel, a wheel on a rover. And when they come to a rock, they're just going bash, bash, and over the top. But now they're realizing, hey, we can be a bit smarter about this, because if we keep doing this, these wheels are going to fail pretty soon. So they're saying, okay, let's just, instead of going crash and relying on the other five wheels, to get the sixth wheel that's stuck on a rock over the rock, why don't we just tell everything, just, hey, slow down and just go gently over the top and roll over the top rather than bash your way over the top. Hopefully, by doing that, the wear and tear on these wheels is going to slow down. So next slide. So here we have some tests they're doing at the, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory where they are running the wheels into obstacles and seeing how can we can gently roll over these things rather than crash into them. So that's the work that's going on there with the Mars rover Curiosity. Next one. Now, just a few picks from Curiosity, uh, recent ones. There's uh, a mixture of rock and sand, 
And, uh, of course, they try to avoid the sand if they can because, after all, we know what happened to spirit and opportunity when they ran into sand. Okay, next picture. And uh, here's a, an example of a sand hill and the structure of it, which they, of course, had to run around. And uh, we've got a, another picture or two of this. And that's looking at that sand hill and you can see the, the materials even slid down the side and so on. So you do, wouldn't want to get too close to that with your rover. Next one. And uh, there's a more distant shot of that same sand hill that they had to drive around. Okay. Just wait. Th now this is a big panorama and uh, if we had time I, we could zoom in and then pan around. It's a 360 degree panorama. Mount Sharp is over there on the right and in the distance you can see the crater walls of Gale Crater. Uh, but you can get an idea of how rough the, the, the terrain is that are running over. Next slide. Once again, this is a 360-degree pan panorama, which uh, I'd love to have time to zoom in and then slowly pan across, but uh, we don't have time. So you can find this on the, on the website. And a few other scenic shots as they... Uh, with Mount Sharp there in the background. Now they are now about 200 metres up from above the landing site where they landed and they're now definitely climbing Mount Sharp having gotten through the, um, the sand hills. All right, next one. All right. Next one. Thanks. You excuse me if I show you pictures of rocks. When I took uh, a group of uh, students, school, school kids, to Central Australia, eventually the kids were saying, Look, Mr. Rennie, there's another rock! Because I was photographing all the different types of rock. Next one. Now, Insight. How many of you got your name on Insight? Right? Well, there it is. There's your name. It's on that little button. And it's been stuck in there. Okay, next picture. And that's it being attached to the InSight lander. So uh, you'll just have to believe NASA that your name really is in there if you submitted it. <laughs> because <laughs> it's not writ large. <laughs> it's, uh, it's very small. Okay, next one. Juno. Got a lot of coverage in the news media here in Australia. Uh, the flyover of the Great Red Spot. And, of course, the main thing is not to take pictures of the uh, planet, like this picture here, uh, but to actually do magnetic field studies and so on. But they're not photogenic for television, so you didn't hear anything about that. The studies it was making and the findings there, what you heard, saw was a few of these uh, pictures, which, by the way, are put together by uh, citizen scientists. And on the NASA website, they're now credited with uh, the, you know, the NASA slash and the name of the person who did the photos. So you can go onto the website there and you can do your own pictures of Jupiter. Right, next picture. Saturn. We're now about two months, uh, September 15. Uh, you can do the calculations yourself. Uh, away from the end of the mission. At the moment, it is doing some very exciting flyovers over the North and South Pole and through the gap between the rings. Next picture. And here's some recent pictures of the uh, hexa hexagon at the North Pole. Right, next picture. Splendid pictures that we've been getting. And here's a comparison between September you know, 2012 and 2016 of the hexagon and how it's changing with the seasons. Do you remember that uh, the Northern Hemisphere is now going into uh, the winter? As we head, as the sun heads south. Okay. Now, one of the advantages of the orbit it's in at the moment is that, that's Cassini's in at the moment, is that it's able to get some detailed pictures of the rings. And you can see there's a clumping going on here on the right hand side, uh, here. And you can't see the individual particles that make up the thing. The resolution is still not good enough for that. But we can see uh, that certainly there's a lot of clumping and so on going on uh, in, in this ring here. 
And of course, here we have the gravitational, so I say it again, the gravity waves. It's not Einstein's gravitational waves. This is just waves caused by the gravity of the moons. And you can see the, it's almost like a phonograph record in the fine detail that has not been visible until now, until now it's doing the close flybys past the rings. Next picture. And this is the most detailed picture taken yet of the propellers. What's happened is there's a little moon in there, probably less than a kilometre across, maybe just a few hundred metres across. Too small to be seen in this picture. And of course what's happening is that it's going around the planet and the rings outside of that are going around slower and the rings inside of that are going around faster. And of course they get disturbed by the gravity of the little moon and, there's that, and that disturbance gets sheared out by the differential rotation of the material one side as against the other. And you can see it's another one here of the same thing. These propellers are named after aviators. So we've got Blerio, Amelia Earhart, and so on. And this one is a French man, I can't remember his name, sorry. Uh, but that's the closest we've seen of these propellers uh, that are happening here. Right, next one. Uh, here is each of these circles highlights a propeller. Right. Now some of these other dashes and flashes here are cosmic ray strikes in the camera. Okay, so they're not stars or anything like that. Uh, these are cosmic ray strikes in the camera. So that streak there, for example. Okay, next picture. Because it's now in that very close orbit around the planet, we are looking at uh, some of the moons in detail for the first time. And these uh, flying saucer moons, I have shown uh, uh, other pictures of these a few months ago, but you can get in here, it's 10 kilometre, that bar there's 10 kilometres, and what's happening is that you've got a, basically a spherical moon, round, roundish moon, and then ring particles are settling onto it in the ring plane, which is basically the equator of the moon. And uh, the full physics of how that's happening and so on hasn't been worked out yet. Okay, next picture. So, as we uh, get some of our last shots of Saturn from Cassini, uh, next picture. We look forward to September 15 when Cassini heads into the atmosphere and here is an artist's impression of what it will look like as it struggles to keep its antenna pointed at the Earth so that we can get the last second of data possible before it finally the aerodynamic drag causes it to tumble and we lose contact. So that's something to look forward to in the evening, our time of September 15 as Cassini heads in. Now, Pluto. You may you all be familiar with um, Sputnik Planum, uh, this uh, heart-shaped area made of two, one part here and another part that's just off the picture there. Well, just a few days ago, the New Horizons team released some digital elevation models and some new maps of the planet. So if we go on to the next picture. This is a digital elevation model of, of Pluto, and notice that Sputnik Planum is up to three kilometres lower than the average elevation of the planet, dwarf planet. So uh, Sputnik Planum is really a low point in, uh, in there, and you've got hills going up as high as about, you know, there's the odd spot there, you can find a little white, few white spots which are up to four kilometres high. Uh, 4,000 metres altitude, but this Sputnik Planum is definitely a low point, which is, you know, the ice is obviously accumulated there. Okay, next picture is of Sharon and a similar thing, but notice the elevation difference is now 14 to 6 kilo, you know, minus 14 to plus 6 kilometres. So over here, we've got a really deep hole here, 14 kilometres deep. So just imagine how amazing it would be to stand in that hole and see the the rim of the thing around you. Okay, next picture. So as we leave Pluto, this is the best enhanced picture they've done there of the atmosphere around 
the uh, dwarf planet. And the next picture shows where we are now. Uh, about halfway, we've just gone about halfway to the next target, which is the Kuiper Belt, KBOS Kuiper Belt object and 2014 MU69, 2014 the year of discovery, and uh, MU69 is the classification of it, and it's out here, so we're about there. And we've already taken pictures, we say we, I mean the, the team there, have already taken pictures of the uh, satellite. Okay, let's think, uh, I think that's it. All right, so if we go to the, the movies. Okay, just quickly through this. This is the uh, MMX. I won't uh, dwell on this, but if you need to scroll down the pages now. So this is a PDF file which you can get from JAXA and stop there. So that's the snow line. Mars, Earth, Venus, Mercury should be all be pretty dry. Somehow or other, water has migrated inwards from the icy materials out here, the gas giants, into Mars and Earth, and maybe even Venus. But how did that happen? That's what JAXA and ISAS is now trying to find out with the um, MMX mission. Next, I scroll, okay. And a whole lot of objectives there which you haven't got time to look at. Next. So the asteroid, the, this overall strategy is to look at comets, asteroids, and dust particles. So the dust particles will be the destiny mission, looking at the dust ejecting bodies uh, there. Hayabusa, looking at the asteroids, and to some extent, if you regard the moons of Mars as being asteroid, captured asteroids, MMX will also be looking at asteroids. Uh, Heading out to the uh, Trojans, the solar sail, and Lucy, of course, as NASA selected that as a mission, but uh, JAXA may launch a, a solar sail uh, to go there as well. And, of course, we've got Rosetta has been looking at the comet through material. Next one. Next one. Okay. All right. Just scroll through, I think, yeah, All right, stop there. So here's the, the plan, is to head out from Earth in uh, July of 2029, sorry, September of 2024, arrive at Mars in August of 2025, spend some time at uh, Phobos, and then leave Mars in uh, 2028, and then come back and land in, land in 2029. So uh, Woomera would be the place to be in 2029 uh, when to see these samples come back. Okay, next one. So we've got a Mars arrival. Uh, we do some orbits around it, observing. We do a first descent and landing. We take off again, go around again, land again at a different spot, obviously. And we may even do, they, they could do several of uh, the landings after, at least two landings, and there could be more. And then we head off back to Earth. Okay, next. Keep going. Keep going. All right, that, we've quit out of that. And we've now got a movie or so. Okay, nice little flyover just recently released a few days ago, or a week or two ago now, flying over Sharon. The altitudes are a little bit exaggerated. Nice little cap here, which stretches quite a long way. And it's got cliffs on the side and slopes, if materials slid down into that chasm. So look at the cliffs there. 
and we've got reels and things. So Sharon is uh, quite an interesting place on its own right. And if you now go to the second of the movies, which is the Pluto one, I think. Okay. Now you can uh, ha download these yourself from the John Hopkins University's website. Uh, probably NASA's also got it up as well. So here we are flying over the, the dark side of Pluto. The sun wasn't shining at the time. And we're going to come up to Sputnik Planum in a few minutes, a few moments. Notice the, the mountains here by here, Sputnik Planum over here. Look at the height of the hills here on the, on the horizon. Again, exaggerated elevation. A couple of impact craters over here. CFR, we've come from the days when they first did this with the Voyager pictures, uh, like Miranda the Fly, Miranda the Movie. I don't know how many of you remember that from uh, 30 years ago. Okay. For many years, I thought Triton was going to be the model for what Pluto might be like. Well, <laughs> we've got a totally new new world. Okay, what's next on that list? Huh? Uh, no, I don't do that. Okay, go into the... Um, we've got uh, about two minutes left. And if you go into the June folder please out of that folder and into the June folder right. the June yes J U N E June and again that's uh, just do the um, ignore the movies we don't have time for those and go to the to the pictures no, they're numbered in the order All right, exoplanets. Exoplanets were the topic last month. And in particular, the release of the Kepler catalogue and the f announcement that there were lots of new Earth-like planets uh, as candidates and some actually confirmed. So here's the size on this side here. And the yellow ones are the new ones that were announced last month. And the <coughs> blue ones uh, were known before last month. And you see that uh, it turns out that you can make a whole lot of planets about the size of the Earth and up to about four times the size. And then there's a gap in uh, candidates to Neptune. And they're trying to work out why is it that you can't get things or very hard to get planets which are in between the size of Earth and Neptune. Right, next one. So this shows where they where some of those new discoveries are in relation to the habitable zone of their planet, of, of their star. This one. Now, the the problem with Kepler is that it, you can find out things in short periods, but if you want to wait, you know, find out things that are taking three years to go around their their star, well, you've got to wait three years between each transit. And of course, Kepler ain't been looking that long, and now it can't, of course, because now it's sort of well, it's got problems. Right, next picture. So here we see that small planets turn out to be very common, but the larger ones are much less common. Okay, next one. 
and you see that gap there between the uh, size relative to the Earth, about up to about one and a half the Earth, and then over here you've got uh, Neptune type stuff, but you haven't got stuff in there which uh, is a mystery. Okay, next one. So they're trying to work out why it is that from the protoplanetary disk you get giant planets, you get lots of those, and you get many Neptunes, and you get a whole lot of Earth type things and super Earths, but in between, no, nothing much. Why? Okay, next one. So there's the, here's some of the things they're trying to work out why uh, from the protoplasma, you know, from the protosolar nebula, you end up with a whole lot of Neptunes or a whole lot of Earth type things, and of course, up further you get the Jupiters and stuff like that, but nothing in between. Ah, question. Okay, next one. So here are the types of things that have been found now, and the orbital period here in days, and in close to their star, you've got lava worlds because it's so blinking hot. Then you've got the rocky planets like Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. You've got the ocean worlds and gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn and their moons. And out here, you, you've got hot Jupiters as well, which are the Jupiter-sized things but are very close to their star. They look at the orbital period here, just a few days. So they're wishing around the star real fast. And we've got the cold gas giants. Out here, they take you know about three years to go around, and they are pretty you know ten times or twenty times the size of the Earth. Here's the frontier where we need a new missions to study things that take a long time to go around, but which are fairly small, and uh, that's where we might find habitable planets like Earth. Next picture. Now Kepler, as I said, was staring at one sky, but then the gyroscopes failed, and since then it's been rolling slowly. So what they did was they, the K2 mission, they now call it, uh, K being Kepler, and you see they stare at a spot in the sky, then move to another spot, then another spot. They can hold it on that spot for a little while, but then it drifts, and so they're drifting around the sky, taking things. So they now, instead of looking at the one spot, and building up a multi uh, thing, they can just look for a, a few months or something at any one spot in the thing. So that's, uh, you know, they did the Cygnus field, which is this one here, up till May, and then they lost control, and since then they've been drifting. Okay, next picture. Lisa and Lisa Pathfinder. Lisa Pathfinder has now finished its mission, and uh, the technology is now considered proven. And here's uh, an artist's impression from ESA on the LISA mission, which is a interferometer mission to find gravity waves. Okay, next one. Uh, well, next one. Evidence for a pole rotation on Enceladus. Now, Enceladus, at the moment, uh, has a south pole down here and you've got the tiger stripes and so on where the gas is coming out and the equator at the moment is around here. However, by recent studies from the Cassini mission have shown that the pole may has shifted and was originally here and you see these things here, that's there, and the tiger stripes were at the nearer the equator but now they're at the pole. So that's been one of the mysteries, is why these tiger stripes, the, and the, presumably the ocean uh, underneath it, is at the near the South Pole, when you would normally expect this sort of thing to be at the equator. Okay, next picture. This is Titan, and a recent Cassini image of Titan, recent as in last month. And you can see some of the lakes there, and cloud here, and some of the sand dune uh, type deserts and some of the higher ground. Right, next one. Uh, yeah, Juno, pretty picture. Next one, pretty picture. Next one. 
This one. This one. Now this has gone red. That means I'm over time, Michael. All right. Sorry, I didn't look at this. Okay, finishing up here now. Um, this is a picture from Juno looking at the stars. You can see there Betelgeuse, for example, as part of the Orion Nebula. But look at this. That is the ring or rings of Jupiter. From inside the rings. We've seen the Voyager's pictures from outside, but here's a picture from inside. Okay, I think we should uh, just make sure there's nothing. I think that's a better. I'm out of time, and we need to hand over to Angelo and Michael for their very interesting presentation. Okay. Fortunately, tonight's uh, presentation is not too much of it. We ran out of time, so you'd be thankful for that. <laughs> but what I did want to do is take the opportunity to just uh, talk a little bit about the anniversary. You're probably done to death with it, but um, the president uh, requested that we show this, so. I'd probably, it is worth seeing actually. Yeah. No, not Twitter. He's the one, he, I think he put it on, uh, well, it's certainly on YouTube. All right. <laughs> okay. If you, if you don't already know, today is actually the 40, 48th, sorry, 48th uh, anniversary of the Apollo 11 splashdown. So uh, there you go. But a few days ago, it was the 48th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. And you know these gentlemen? <laughs> Very good. You never get sick of seeing some of these photos, I must admit. And there's uh, the famous uh, photo of Neil. <laughs> that oh, are you sure that's Neil? Oh yes, yeah, that's not Neil. That's Buzz. But in the visor is Neil taking the picture. The little guy in the middle. Okay. Apparently, Len, you'd probably know the facts, but I think there's about you know two thousand pictures of Buzz on the moon, and there's about two of Neil. Five. Five. So it's pretty amazing. Uh, but as Buzz would always say, uh, Neil was holding the camera. So. Which is not true. Anyway, <laughs> let's not go there. All right, this is the video. Um, video of the landing, um, and it's narrated by Neil Armstrong in 2012 when he visited Australia. Let me show this one. August 11. Correct. Because he passed away in 2001. Like this is good. It's actually, it's actually quite an interesting video. Uh, Uh, it's actually not showing me. Go on. Oh, there we go. I was trying to get my... Yeah, that's it. Okay, we've got it. Peter Albert was uh, lucky enough to be there. And you were too. Glenn. 
This slide shows the trajectory to the surface. The actual power descent of the lunar module to the surface took 12 minutes and 32 seconds. And this is just the final three minutes, the part that's really interesting as you get close to the surface of the moon. Now, in the left screen, you will see the original 1969 movie film that we took from the window of the lunar module Eagle. And on the right side, you will see what the crew saw looking out the window in front of them. Now, there is a, a shaded area there that shows you the exact duplicate of the area that's on the left, so you can compare the craters and see if they are duplicate of each other. The one on the left took place 42 years ago. This pictures on the right took place in the last two years. Okay, we've been descending. Uh, I should tell you, you'll hear the crewmen talking. My, they're my co-pilot giving altitude and, and descent rates, and you'll hear people in the background uh, talking from mission control on Earth. We've been descending uh, about 2,000 meters a minute. We're now down to uh, about below 1,000 meters in altitude. Uh, you the, my my uh, com my computer tells me that we're it's taking us to a landing just on the right side of that big crater on the up in the up left hand corner. The slopes are steep and the rocks look very large, the size of automobiles. Certainly not a place that I want to land. So I took over manually from the computer, the autopilot, and flew it like a helicopter on out to the west to try to find a smoother, more level landing spot. The computer is complaining now and then. You'll hear caution alarms, 1202s and 1201s, which uh, is telling us the computer is a little bit concerned about its operation, but everything looks good, and the people in mission control tell us we can continue. Okay, we're about uh, 100 meters above the sort of looking down at this 30 meter crater, about 8 meters deep, looks like a real geological trader, uh, treasure. I want to go back there and look at that if I ever get the chance while I'm on, on my, on my on foot. We're looking for a, a smooth spot beyond that crater. I see a smooth spot right up near the top of the screen. It looks like that's a that's a good place to be, and I'm running low on fuel. I have less than two minutes of fuel. Getting down below about 70 meters now. 50 meters, still looking good. In the left side, you will see in the old movie that the rocket engine is starting to kick up some dust, dust off, the, off the surface. Get a 30 second fuel warning. Need to get it down on the ground here pretty soon before we run out. Okay. It, it's, the, the picture on the left is more accurate, but there's more dust. There you see the shadow of my landing leg coming on, on the surface, on the blowing dust. We're very close to the, the surface right now. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. Pretty, uh, pretty cool. I do actually have another video, but uh, this was one that recently got posted. How do I get my mouse back out to there? Go that way. Oh, I see. Ah, here you go. All right. Yeah, well, it's not not where that tab is. Here we go. Yeah, just uh, quickly, this was one that uh, was recently put up. It's very similar, but what it actually does, it shows you, uh, names the craters as you as it's flying along. It's exactly the same, pretty much. It'll start eventually.
Oh, this is different. This, sorry, this is another video. This actually shows you the um, taking from the lunar rec reconnaissance orbiter, and it actually shows you different times of the day on the moon. But that's actually high resolution picture of the descent module sitting on the on the moon now. And if you look closely, you might you might actually see some of the tracks. And you'll see some of the tracks going to the um, the west crater, I think they call it, even though it's on the east. It looks like it's on the east side, but the uh, so north must be down. Yeah. You'll actually see pictures of the hardware. And there's a TV camera that we would have seen facing north. Uh, watching the uh, for the moon. I won't keep going with that because that takes a fair bit. So we'll go to the next slide. Oh, well, there you go. Got to get a picture of that. Nice art. Probably. That was a good. That was a good thought. Yeah, I think so. Oh, oh, no, oh, th th absolutely. There's a there's a, a moon invasion about to start in the next couple of years, so you can bank on the fact that everyone's going there, even the Americans. The current launch vehicle is PowerPoint, so let's wait and see if it gets through. <laughs> uh, okay, okay. okay. everybody's not going. going. All right, All right. Let's, let's, uh, let's go back to this and start, start the other one. one. Just, Just a bit of space news. So that was a little bit on postscript on that. I was contacted recently by James Hansen who's revamping the book First Man for 2019. He wanted to add a bit about the, the um, Neil video interviews that were done in Australia and how they were publicly released when they weren't supposed to be. Oh, is that right? And he said, do you know anything about it? I said, no, a bit. So I sent him a bit about that because um, when the story broke, it was in early 2012, and um, I have been fortunate enough to have a little bit of email correspondence with Mr. Armstrong, and I said, I'll give you a heads up to this. He said, yeah, I know. He said, they weren't supposed to be released. He said, thanks for the heads up. I've already got the press coming to my door. So I sent all that material to, um, to Jim Hansen, and he yeah. said, he's also spoken to Carol Armstrong about it. He said, um, the CPA, the head of CPA Australia, Alex Malley, he said, is a snake. I said, yeah, I reckon. And then I sent him, the day after he sent me that, it was a big story in the paper that Alex Malley got sacked. <laughs> so I sent him out and said, you can add that as well. Yeah. So he said, um, he's going to put a little bit in the, in the next edition of the book about that. Oh. That'll be interesting. And the other thing that's coming out, of course, is the, uh, the movie of Neil Armstrong. So, uh... Uh, yes. So that'll be something to see. Do you know when it's coming in? Uh, the, the premiere, I think, is November 18, 2018. So it'll just be around about the 50th anniversary. Almost. Almost. So pretty... Anybody pretty who's watched the, the um, Netflix series The Crown, uh, um, about the English royal, the British royal family, uh, the lady who plays Queen Elizabeth, Claire Foy, will play Janet Armstrong. Very good. Anyway, another good one, hopefully. Yeah, it's one, one for the... the uh, Okay. Okay. okay, just a little bit of an update. I didn't have time to, to really go into this in great detail, detail but... Uh, of course, I've got to... How come I can't do this again? Why can't I... Hang on. Let's try again. Here we go. Uh, Washington Roundup. A few things have happened over the last uh, month or so, but uh, surprise, surprise, the House has actually advocated or, or put together a bill to uh, provide NASA with more money than what the NASA budget request that comes from the, uh, from the administration was. So it actually gives NASA uh, $19.9 .9 billion in 2018, which is $780 million more uh, than the uh, more than what it would have its request, more than its request, and that's two hundred million dollars more than it got in twenty seventeen. If you recall, twenty seventeen they had a kind of a record budget uh, for for these times, 
uh, Apollo budgets uh, were in the order of about a hundred billion dollars a year, which is some ridiculous figure. But uh, in current terms, uh, 19 billion is not a bad bad effort. Uh, so they've really uh, it was a significant increase for exploration programs, and also to fund what was actually terminated was some of the education programs. Uh, and some of the programs, like the Europa Lander, are back on the agenda. And I love NASA's strategy. Get rid of some of the good stuff and the money comes back. One way or the other. Now, it's got to get through the, 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 the Senate and all the rest of it, but it's, chances are they'll get the money. The, finally, the National Space Council was re-established. Um, the last time it was around was in the uh, early 90s with uh, Bush number one. And it'll be chaired by Vice President Mike Pence with uh, an executive secretary, the guy that does the work, called Scott Pace. He's currently a director of space policy at the uh, George Washington University. The um, NASA administrator or takes him out of the running completely? I, I think, think it's personally, I think it takes him out of the running. Because he wants to be in an, in an objective um, position. They're, they're in no hurry to either develop space policy or appoint another administrator. At the moment, the, the acting administrator, Lightfoot, may just get the gig. <laughs> okay. Okay. The other thing is, uh, and this is not really civil space, but it's US Air Force, uh, you know, they can't wait to militarise space, but uh, the House has actually put together a bill to create a space corps. Now, the Air Force are dead against this. They'll be a sub-branch of the Air Force. The Air Force is dead against it. They just think it's bureaucracy and less control for them directly. Absolutely. So, so, but but, but it, it's actually had, in the House, it actually got wide support, which surprised me. And now, But the Senate's not really keen on it. So now it's got to go through the machinations of getting through the Senate. But I just, I, I was just kind of horrified. Now, I don't know what the Chinese or, um, mind you, the Chinese space program is run by the People's Liberation Army anyway. Uh, but, you know, having a space corps is just crazy, crazy stuff. I don't know, but but it's, uh, it's the first step to militarising space, which we certainly don't want. Uh, also, Charlie Bolden... Uh, came out and basically said, you know, Trump with administration is failing to back up its space rhetoric with funding. But what was interesting to me was the next bit. He said the new administration had the opportunity to show leadership by actually funding the first SLS flight with men in it. Remember, we spoke about it some months back and they canned it. And Bolden is saying it was canned because of money. Uh, the Trump administration didn't want to fund it. Now, it had been delayed from 2018 or 2019 launch, but even so, I thought that was uh, an interesting point. He also supported uh, putting Robert Lightfoot in a position permanently, and I never miss a chance to put up Trump on the, on the screen. I forgot what he was signing at that stage, but uh, they're all mates now because during the elections they all hated each other. Um, Europa Clipper gets the tick. And Europa Lander might get the tick for a year, but probably get uh, dumped the following year. And these are the two blokes we're talking about. He's the vice president. And Scott Pace is the, um, the secretary. Bit on the space station. Um, Russia is going to start sending tourists back up there. So if you've got a few rubles that you'd like to give them, they'll uh, next year. Oh, oh sorry, sorry they won't. Oh, real dollars. Okay. All right. Euros, perhaps. Anyway, the bottom line is they're now talking about uh, sending tourists back up there because they've got a spare seat because the Americans are launching via uh, Boeing or via SpaceX. And uh, but they're also they also said uh, we've got people who want to go for the trip around the moon, a la SpaceX. You know, grey grey dragon. And they said, but we just need someone to fund the development of the Soyuz spacecraft to get it capable of going to the moon. Anyway, so if you've got a few dollars, you can probably do both. Uh, there we go. A few pictures of uh, the Russian stuff.
Then we go on to commercial resupply services. Uh, CRS 11, if you remember, uh, we had the launch and it, the fantastic landing, beautiful video, came back. And that was the second time that capsule had flown. So good for SpaceX. Now we've got the commercial crew transportation. A uh, bit of general. Uh, NASA has now given an update of the new launch schedules um, as the next generation of the spacecraft are, are sort of getting towards uh, final stages of development and evaluation. Uh, to meet the requirements, the commercial providers have, have to demonstrate the systems are ready to go. Now, there's going to be two demonstrations, uncrewed, uh, one from SpaceX, one from Boeing, and then there will be two missions, one from Boeing, one from SpaceX, manned. They become the test flights. After that, both Boeing and SpaceX starts uh, committing to its contract of resupply of the space station with astronauts. Well, I'll come to that. Boeing, uh, this is their schedule at the moment. Uh, there will be no pad aboard, as we've said on many occasions. They haven't moved. They haven't moved in about a year, these dates here. Uh, they're looking at uh, June 18, uncrewed, and August 18, manned flight on the Atlas. And there's the Atlas, and you'll see the uh, um, CST-100 or the Star Starliner. SpaceX, their dates are February. Now, that was November. I thought the slip would be more than that, but it, it hasn't been. So far, it's February. Um, and it's kind of supported by news coming out of SpaceX and NASA as well. So uh, in a few months' time, not so long, we'll see uh, SpaceX uh, take their uh, Crew Dragon into space. And early in 2018, they're scheduled to do a in-flight abort. So we're not quite sure when. No date has come about. But before they test, uh, they fly their manned mission in June of 2018, it was April. Um, they're going to do that. And that's what it looks like. And there it is sitting on the launch pad. SpaceX General. Uh, all the black have has happened. Amazing launch rate, as we've spoken about over the last couple of months. The next one that's going up, that uh, 11th of August, is CRS-12. That's now uh, moved to the 14th, no earlier than the 14th of August. And then on uh, no earlier than the 28th, we've got the X-37B, uh, which is the US Air Force uh, space plane. We'll be getting a lift from a Falcon 9. Likely in October, um, it'll probably remember, we'll have the Falcon Heavy. And that's uh, they're moving at a great rate of knots of getting that, that going. And no earlier than September 2017, uh, there is a another uh, Air Force, and that's the reason why they've got to get this Falcon Heavy going, because they've got a, an Air Force, big Air Force payload to go up. Uh, it's not going to be September, it'll be later than that. Grey Dragon, still on the books. That's the um, swing around the moon with some very rich benefactor. But the big news for the month was Red Dragon, uh, Cancelled. Ain't going to happen. I'll come back to that. Uh, key events that are happening with SpaceX. Space Launch Complex 40 is now being repaired. Uh, 39A is well on the way to being demolished. If anyone, I couldn't get a picture of it, but if you have a look at today's sort of picture, you'll see half that service structure uh, is now starting to disappear. And they have to get rid of that for Falcon. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Uh, Landing Zone 1 is being expanded. I'll show you a picture of that. We spoke about that last month. The Texas site is well underway to give them another launch facility. Uh, SpaceX has one final upgrade of Falcon. It's called the Block 5. They're currently flying to Block 3. Block 4 is about to fly. Uh, Block 5 is the final iteration of the Falcon. And it really is it addresses the issues that NASA want to launch men into space. So it addresses all these little... Uh, um, uh, certification issues and uh, safety issues. 
Um, he also reaffirmed uh, that developing rocks is difficult. He didn't realise the magnitude of problems in de developing the Falcon Heavy. He's, <laughs> I'm serious. He actually had to re, yeah, exactly. He had to redesign the whole of the core stage, and it's got to do with vibrations. And he's actually downplaying the expectations on this thing because some of the vibrations testing can only happen with launches. They can't simulate this stuff. So there is a real possibility that things can go badly wrong with this uh, on its first launch. So uh, they really have to launch it to verify the, uh, uh, the way it works. And, and what really complicates it is not only the stresses that the rocket goes through, but if a couple of engines fail, they've got to um, design it to account for those uh, mishaps. So... <laughs> so, so anyway... anyway. They, he's, he's really had trouble with it, but the important thing is he's downplaying it, so he's saying don't expect a perfect launch. Um, a lot of people in the industry are saying don't expect a perfect launch too, so they all know how hard it is. Um, Elon Musk will hold off to update his Mars architecture. When he cancelled Dragon, he actually proposed uh, that he's got a new architecture, uh, and guess what? It'll happen in Adelaide in September, we hope. Pretty interesting. So he's, he's acknowledging the entry, landing, and descent approach problem to Mars. It's very difficult. He he is, but but I, look, the story I got, and I suspect it's probably a bit of bit of everything. But the story I got was that NASA was not keen on having uh, a heat shield that had legs pop out of it. Now I think back to the space shuttle. It has wheels, big wheels coming out of it. So why have they been so hard on? say SpaceX. So the theory is that's not the only reason. It is a hard thing to do. It is a hard thing to do and he, he probably just said, no, too hard to develop, cost us a lot of money, we'll move on. But he is offering a smaller, you know, not like this interplanetary transport thing that he's talking about. He's offering something smaller but much larger than the Dragon. So we'll see what uh, comes of it and we'll start to hear about it in September. I don't know how well advanced these plans are but we hope that uh, Mars is not too far off the radar. It was going to be 2020. Okay, it might be shifted 2023 or 24, but yeah, it's still in the sort of um, it's still in the uh, in the sights. Uh, oh, the other thing is, of course, he's coming over to Adelaide to probably see that uh, he's finished his big battery that he's meant to do in 100 days, or it's free. <laughs> so that'll be good. Uh, and there's the structure. Now that's the space shuttle structure, um, and the middle bit uh, is starting to disappear. And within the next month, you'll find that'll be gone, and you're only left with the the main tower. There it is, Falcon Heavy versus Falcon Nine. There's the heavy on the pad. There's the Launch Complex Forty um, after the explosion. If the Falcon Heavy explodes on 39A, um, he's going to have a bit of a problem because all the manned launches to the space station are meant to be off 39A. Now, he's got he's building other pads, I know, back to 40, but uh, they're not man-capable, I suspect. So uh, he doesn't want to blow that pad up, that's for sure. And these are the uh, landing zones he's building, and there it is of a recent picture. Uh, SpaceX moon mission, Grey Dragon still on, cancelled, won't happen. Now we go to Jeff Bezos. Blue Origin is to build a factory to produce the BE4 engines in Huntsville, Alabama. They were trying to get him into Florida, but he went uh, Alabama. Uh, he'll employ 300 people and produce 30 engines a year, probably to be right next to ULA. Uh, ULA will use, I mean, they're, fr they're front runners to provide engines to the new uh, Vulcan uh, rocket. And launch uh, Complex 36, uh, they're using that as a launch pad as well as a launch complex uh, 11 for engine testing. And of course, this was a concept he recently made to say to NASA, we'll provide transport for you to the moon. Um, you know, we'll build this for you. You just buy the, uh, uh, the gear. There he is. There's his new Glenn rocket. 
there's the B4, this is the size. So we're now into the super rocket uh, uh, phase, if you like. We're going to start, starting with Falcon Heavy, we're going to start seeing some big rockets come off the line. Uh, what's this one? Why didn't that come up? That must be a video. We're not going to play that. Size matters, there you go. And it's got uh, how many? Six? Seven. BE4 engines. Quite a sizable rocket, actually. Now, there's the factory. Now, Michael and I last night spent, must have been an hour and a half, looking for where this actually is, but there it is. Now, for those that know Kennedy Space Centre, the top of the page, within walking distance, is the visitor centre. So this is what's called Exploration Park. To the right, there's more development there that's going on. But this is Jeff Bezos' shed. And the roof has started in the middle and slowly stretching across. So, yeah, well, now you'll see on Instagram there's a video of him sitting on a roof holding a rocket factory to come. Now the whole roof is finished. Of the building itself, yeah. on the car park. So it's, it, it's, it's a, 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 a sizable uh, building. building. And then to, to the, the right, right uh, uh, to the left top is uh, Web. What's it called? One Web. Yeah, they're right next to to Origin. Orbital ATK. I just they're due to fly uh, Antares with the new Russian engines. Um, uh, shortly. They still never made an announcement because the Air Force were looking at another launcher, so I don't know where they got to with that. Sierra Nevada. Well, the Dream Chaser is on the move at Edwards. So we've been saying that they're going to do another test flight, but uh, finally they're actually been dragging it along the runway, letting it go to see how it steers itself and does its things. Uh, it's a little baby shuttle for those that don't know what Dream Chaser is. And the drop tests are going to happen shortly. Uh, in the meanwhile, the cargo version is, is being developed. Those tests that they're doing at Edwards are actually part of one of their first contracts that uh, they got, uh, but then they didn't get the ongoing contract of flying men. And there it is. And this was at uh, Edwards not uh, so long ago. This was the mission in, when was it? 2013, where the one of the landing gear didn't come down and it... Uh, we never quite saw it rolling along the runway, but it did. And this is what they're actually building. And what they've done is they've ordered two Atlas rockets for 2020 and 21 to actually take cargo to the space station. Strato launch, the other thing that came up was the Air Force is interested in it, perhaps. So that, I guess, uh, helps with uh, his business case. Because all as he was going to launch at this point with the big... Uh, plane was uh, Pegasus um, rockets and it was meant to be for bigger rockets but they've never quite sti stitched that game up but maybe the Air Force can uh, can use it uh, we showed that last time it is the biggest wingspan of any aircraft ever built X Prize um, the X Prize we're running out of time wanted to just quickly look at was Moon Express. He came up the other day, the anniversary of the Apollo 11, with a, a sort of an architecture of, uh, I'll give you a ride to the, to the moon on these things. And uh, he's talking about launching this thing in certainly the Lunar X Prize, if he can get it up, but he's flying the Electron Rocket, Rocket Lab Electron Rocket, which Almost got to orbit from New Zealand, if you recall, but didn't quite get there. So the rocket's not ready. He's, you know, the Lunar X Prize time is running out, so they might not uh, get there for the Lunar X Prize, which is worth $20 million to them. Uh, sorry? Well, there's, it, it break, apparently it breaks up into various components. Any reason to expect to see anyone throw something at the moon in the next six months? Um, I'd say 50-50. Be nice if they did. But this one is one of the close ones. Uh, and 
he's built an architecture. This guy's about uh, mining, moon mining. But uh, he's built an architecture where he straps, you know, six of these things together and he can actually do uh, lunar re sample returns. Uh, but he's actually got a, a, a little gig going with some astronomical company to provide a little observatory up in the South Pole near Shackleton Crater. Um, so that seems to be heading in the right direction for 2020, 21. So this guy, you know, he, he almost looks like he's got the, the credentials. So we'll see what happens. And he'll fly, of course, on the Electron. I have no idea how he's going to do it. I thought it was underpowered myself, but he's flying the Electron. Go figure. That's it. Thank you.